Okay, scholars, scholars, European intellectual history scholars. Okay, um, here again, boy, it'd be fun if we were talking about stuff. Uh, the plan was that we would be uh, chatting about some big issues of, of uh, geodesy, Ge uh, the, the, the earth. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've come up with already is this notion of a infinity, uh, the, the expansiveness, the, uh, this, uh, Shapin was talking about how, how the, the cosmos just got huge, and, um, and so there's this, the, the, uh, the enlightenment is greatly inspired by the hugeness of the cosmos, but the other thing is also the size of the earth, and so we want to talk about the earth today. And, and especially how you have methods of thinking about the earth that are, uh, are developing and, and becoming very sophisticated. And in some ways, uh, and this we'll get to at the end, is a type of uh, uh, tension between how much we generalize and how much we particularize uh, what, we're, uh, what we're looking at. So, uh, you know, uh, there's so many ways we could do this, but I uh, thought it'd be fun. Uh, to look at the sort of three great voyages of, uh, first off, of the uh, Edmund Haley in the, in the Paramour, which is this small pink, you know, it's a great story. Then you got Captain Cook, and he's got James Banks with him in the first, first trip out. A bunch of, a whole boatload of scientists, you know, go with Cook. And then you have uh, Darwin and Fitzroy traveling together in the Beagle around the world. And, and uh, this is in the 1690s, the 1778, and then this is in the 18, 1834 to 36 range. So, so let's uh, let's talk about these. And and uh, here again, if you've got questions or into, if something sounds interesting, I'd love to you know email. We can set up a time to talk. And uh, but otherwise, there's a um, I'm going to walk you through some of the assignment I gave you to read about Haley. Haley's definitely the most interesting of these guys. So, let's start off. This is, uh, you know, Geodes, which is the study of the, of the Earth. You know, what, how does it work? The Earth is like a machine. It's like, but it's not like a clockwork machine. It's, this is the thing. It's not the clockwork universe. There's, there's such chaos in it. But one of the first things that, uh, uh, first parts of this is, is, is when the Spanish Empire moves into the Pacific and they could get out to the Philippines, but Magellan's job was to get back and he failed. He dies, first of all, that, and, then he, and then his boat actually travels around the world. So Magellan's boat's famous for getting around the world as a European boat, but it, he failed because you're supposed to come back. And this, this journey here, uh, twice, uh, Erdneta, this uh, Augustinian friar, uh, was sent out to the Philippines and was going to come back. First time he went, went all the way around the world, but then later, when he's over 60 years old, my age, oh, he's my hero, but he's sent out there and to bring a boat back. And he does, and it's called the Erdnez route. And it's the, you know, you got to watch the currents and watch the, the weather and watch the winds and how the currents of the winds, this Japan current comes up and moves across and and when does it, you know, it's temperatures change and stuff. And he was watching all of that, and he actually then charts it. And you get the Erdnetta route, which completes then a, uh, uh, a type of new Silk Road in world history. So, so it's, the, it's this, uh, this is what we're talking about today, is, the, is this sort of new, coming out of the Renaissance, we now know the world much better than we've ever known it before. And let's go out and explore it. Let's and this becomes the big project between, say, uh, 1500 and, and uh, 1900. 1900, you're finally getting to the South Pole and stuff like that. But from between 1500 and 1900, we've got to figure out what this world is, how it works, not just what, what's out there. Okay? So this is the European intellectual history. It's really a great time. This, uh, some kind of call it age of exploration, but that... You know, a lot of the explorers are doing it 
not for uh, intellectual reasons. They're doing it for greed, and that's the sad story. Uh, a lot of missionaries are out there doing intellectual stuff along with being missionaries, like Father Erdnetta. But uh, um, what we're talking about today is actually the what we would call almost secular scientists, uh, a completely completely scientific endeavor, which is paid for by the government. Okay, so. Uh, let's start with Haley. Okay, uh, this is Haley's uh, boat. It's uh, called a pink. It's a, uh, a small three-masted ship here, and it's uh, I think about I think only about 50 feet long. And it, um, it looks bigger in the picture here, but it's a uh, um, uh, yeah, it, it's a pink, and he calls it. It's called the Paramore, and it's actually uh, His Majesty's ship. It is a government-owned ship, and it's a great story about Haley. Um, I like it because Haley's the scientist who gets named captain of a government ship, causes trouble on the on the first voyage, and then he has other voyages, and um, but he becomes this captain, and then later in his life uh, he has a very small pension after he's retired as royal astronomer and Queen Anne Queen Anne hears that he's you know sort of economically struggling and and they retroactively give him uh, the uh, the pension of a captain in the Navy and so he's never in the Navy but he's half he's this he's a scientist brought into the Navy and that's a there's a sort of grand tradition of these kinds of people where there's scientists Navy people you know uh, we get it in also in the space and NASA now stuff too but uh, it, with the fun of Haley is that he was pure scientist that they actually gave him the command he's the he's the captain of the ship and uh, of a Royal Navy ship and uh, and does his his work Okay, and see, get great books like this. He also, he studies tides, he studies magnetism, he studies wind patterns, he studies, he just, the earth just fascinates him. He's most famous for that comet. Now, here again, I'm not sure if it's called Halley or Haley. It's probably Halley, since there's two L's, but I don't, uh, I've heard it both ways. I grew up saying it Haley, but, um, so don't worry about it. But the thing is that, uh, this fascinating guy, and I just want to sort of like run through a little and show you the range of things that Haley looks at and what makes him so in, in exciting. This is the book I have you reading out of for the class. This is his chart for uh, for winds right there. Okay, let me let me go over to the the book here. This is uh, this is Alan Cook's book. Man, this is a this is a heavy going book, and uh, believe me, I don't understand most of it because it gets in a lot into the math and, and stuff, and, and it makes the point that, that uh, Haley is a, a major mathematician. But he's a young man working, as we said, secretary to the uh, Royal Society, and then he actually leaves his position to uh, do this para work with the paramour and uh, goes into. Uh, his clerkship here, and then it talks about him as a mathematician and goes into a stuff here that I actually don't have you read. I took out some of that. And then this question of geomagnetism and meteorology, which are two areas of geodesy, which are great mysteries, actually. Meteorology, of course, is weather prediction, and you can't predict very far. It's like the human body. There's just so many variables. The human mind, so many variables. You can't. The, and, it, and then there's chaotic things going on in it. So, so the thing is, is that uh, uh, you can't. You can use put all your mathematical skills into this and try and make it work. And it still is very hard to come up with anything that that doesn't uh, bring out the mysteries of it. The big deal with the. Uh, with uh, um, magnetism, of course, is the variation or what gets called declination of the, uh, the magnet here. They establish, he established this is a theory of declination. And what declination is, just to give you a little quickie here, 
is this is Haley's map of declination, which is that when you're out there, your compass moves around in weird ways. You know, the compass does not point at north and actually does these weird uh, variations in it. Uh, it, it it, it, it doesn't work in these sort of, sort of normal ways. And this is why you've got to get out and sail all through here and, and figure out the, this, how this, this varies here, this difference between true north and magnetic north. Very important for uh, navigation. That's why the government pays for the boat. That's why it's such, you know, the government loves Haley for doing this. But... Uh, Haley is as Matt. He brings the practicality with the sort of high-level uh, interest in the theory together, which is uh, what makes him so exciting to uh, to people today and and throughout history. This notion that he helped uh, uh, he he not only sort of figures things out, he knows that he needs to create a map, a schema that's going to show wind patterns and magnetism patterns and all of this other sort of stuff. Uh, he, he also uh, goes into, uh, this, is, this is also another area which he explores. He's one of the gr first great explorers in this area we call demography now, which is, which is statistical studies, okay? Let's take death rates, okay? And death rates, you can figure out death rates, you know, by getting church records and stuff like that. You gather in all sorts of data, and then you number crunch it. You create statistics, and you can start to guess how many people are going to die for, you know, within a certain number of years under certain conditions. And so this is hugely useful to the development of insurance, uh, but then it's also the beginnings of political science and polling. All sorts of stuff comes out of this. And, uh, and, and he has a a vision for it, that, that somehow if I gather data and sort of smush it, I throw out the extremes and I take the very, and I, 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 I make a model which looks prettier, um, we, can, we can predict something, we can know something, okay? And uh, this is exactly how we, uh, we're doing today with this when you when these news people say, well, the science says, or we're going to follow, you know, some politician says we're going to follow the science on this. No, no, what they're following is really uh, this type of demo, uh, statistical work that Haley Haley's the great pioneer of, uh, which is is the it's a high belief that in the that there's these sort of almost superstitious forces to mathematics. That mathematics is the sort of priestly indicator to how how things work and, and we can predict. And so you can actually throw out the, the uh, variances and create a model. Uh, this is uh, what he says down here. Uh, many have commented on how original Haley was in the treatment of how tables and formula have been followed. But the important philosophical point seems not to have been made. Namely, that Haley's procedures depend upon the assumption that the statistics of a sample, okay, are truly representative of a much larger population. See, that's polling. Only if that is, uh, if that is so, are calculator of annuities based on statistical frequencies in Breslau simply just by the philosophical justification has been argued from the times of Bayes and Laplace. These are great mathematicians of probability and statistics, a Bayesian probability stuff. So, you know, uh, Haley, Haley's this young man. He's not rich or anything. He's got a wife. He's got kids. He's a, he's a secretary of society, but he's, he just is a hard, hard worker. I, He's not really a genius, but he just he he's he's he he's got the vision of math that's up there toward where Newton's at, and he can help Newton. But then he can also apply it in so many different ways. Um, so <laughs> remember that Newton was spending a lot of his time applying it to when the Second Coming would happen and how to read the Book of Daniel and all that sort of stuff. 
But Haley went much more practical than Newton did. And uh, so you even, the study of antiquity, uh, a lot of what was uh, the dates you read for things in, the, in your textbooks have a, you know, like, where do they come up with a date in ancient history like that? You know, the, they can tell you the month, the day, and, and the date in, a, you know, 300 years B.C. And you know, how do they do that? Well, there's, chronology had been a great study for a long time in Europe. And we've actually seen it with the development of calendars and stuff like that. But, but uh, Haley takes it to another extreme because he can actually do more than just look at an, uh, an eclipse, but he can actually look at uh, correlate tides and things like that. As the, this talks about, he can figure out when Caesar comes into Rome or Caesar comes into England and stuff like that. Yeah, this is actually a sort of fun thing is how look, just he infers... Uh, and he concludes, and he confirms, he, you know, he interprets, he founds. This is that loose language of, of, uh, of sort of how to, how to, um, how you're working with things you really don't know. But, uh, this is, this is science. This is the beginning of it. And, uh, then we have the celestial architecture here. Um, this is where we get into comets. And comets is this another place where he uses history. His history comes together. Uh, uh, Haley's one of the great historians. He's, he gets into the archives and he studies and studies these comet sightings. And he has, uh, oh, and by the way, he, here's our brattle here, the American Observer. I just want to point that out. We got a lot of that. Guy. But he has this um, ability which the guy calls here, our author calls here, uh, inspired insight. Because you're looking at all these weird comet sightings and all these documents and stuff like that, and it, it's not simply going to just jump out to you from the data. It, Haley, Haley, Haley has a type of insp inspiration. And this inspiration is rooted in an idealism about math and the possibilities of math, but then also possibilities of structure and especially mechanic, mechanics. And that's where um, we talked about the Brattle... Lath and, and Haley uh, looking at that comet in 1684, I think it was, and seeing it as, as not just shooting straight, it actually starts to orbit. That's that first idea of cometary orbits. And then Haley takes it further with another comet to a, what now is called Haley's Comet. Okay, so, you know, fascinating stuff here. Then, and then one of the big issues for Cook and uh, what's going to be for the next hundred years is this: how do we how do we get longitude well? And there are ways to do longitude well. Latitude is easy. You know, look at the North Star, the horizon, the angle. Latitude's easy, and, and people tended to, out throughout history to sail on latitudes. But uh, longitude is how you actually have to work with time and know where you are on the Earth. And so longitude becomes a great great issue. But one of the things of longitude is to, this is what we've talked about before, is longitude and latitude are built around the idea that the Earth is a sphere. And you actually sort of, actually sort of avoid the truth, Earth isn't a sphere, and create a sort of model which, okay, let's call the Earth a sphere, and then let's create latitude and longitude. Let's do navigation, and it's, it'll be good enough. This is where... There's a, a lot of fudging. You fudge data. This is where that demographic mentality comes in. A lot of statistics. Throw out the anomalies. Throw out these extreme particulars. And, and let's, let's sort of come up with a, a, a line that actually, you know, the data doesn't fit. But, but it, it, we can see it in there. We can have insight to see it. And so that's where longitude really works. But then what also this book is fun for talking about is how um, Haley, Haley, Haley's one of these early figures who sees how dynamic, the, <laughs> dynamic all this stuff is. And so you can't just create a law of nature. Uh, magnetism doesn't follow laws really well. It's, it's, it's moving around up there. You know, one of the things about magnetism is that like magnetic north 
keeps moving and it moves at irregular rates and even if you got this map even closer it doesn't it's not a straight line or anything it's and then look it's you know for 60 years it's doing this far and in the last 60 years it's done this look at that and and so magnetism keeps moving this is why the declinations got to keep being figured out and so what Haley is good at is seeing not only, he's not only good at the fudging the data, he's actually allows the data to teach him about sort of chaotic things. And, uh, you know, this is fun. I gave, I didn't make you read a whole bunch of this, wanted to get away. But um, here's the conclusion of it. You do not have to understand all this, and I don't understand all this, but, uh, but take it in as a, as an accumulation, as a, as a, as a, uh, a number of interesting stories to point out how broad-minded this is and how especially science, is one of our themes in this class is that there is no one science. The science doesn't say that there's, there's a whole bunch of ways of doing things. And so, um, you know, this is Haley, uh, Haley has a number of ways of thinking. It's a plural ways of thinking. It's not a, a way of thinking. And um, most important, for me at least, is this notion that the cosmos is not static. Its history has to be understood in dynamical terms, and its dynamics have to be elucidated from historical records, which is a really big, you know, thing. Uh, part of what we get to Darwin here, see, Darwin, Darwin, Darwin wants to take out the dynamical aspects of it, or at least he wants to make the dynamical aspects of it much more simple. And he also, you know, the, the idea of these historical records don't work for Darwin, so he can just, he can just imagine a sort of slow curve or a slow gradient of, of evolution or something uh, in, in the background there. And here he is. Uh, this is a man who has imaginative insight into the physical world. And uh, Haley had an exceptional range of imaginative insight, imaginative methods of doing things. And uh, what is fun and why we're so, I think what makes him so interesting to, to uh, me is that, is that he does this by looking so closely at the earth and just not thinking of the earth as a clockwork machine, lot of nature as laws, but actually as a very sort of tides. He's fascinated by tides, spends years studying tides. We still, tides are, you, everything you learned about tides is so oversimplified. Tides are so complex. And uh, it's so, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, they talk about sea, sea level rise. Sea level rise in California is much higher than sea, much faster, much, much greater effect than sea level rise in, up in Seattle. Now, this happens has to do with the way the, the earth is moving, all sorts of things. So, so uh, you know, this dynamical wind patterns, tidal, you know, this is Haley had a vision. This. Haley saw it. Haley, you know, this is where uh, we don't have necessarily progress all the time. So, uh, let's go on here. I'm just giving you a little sort of encouragement to read that and then do your assignment. Give me a call if you want to chat about this. Cook, I, you know, there's so many books on Captain Cook, and he is so, so interesting. Uh, he's a, a working sailor, uh, poor, not a poor family, but, a, you know, not a, certainly just as a, you know, working class family. And, uh, and uh, he had become a great sailor and joins the Navy as a young man. And then um, eventually they, he's able to become a lieutenant. And right after he becomes a lieutenant, he's great at surveying and stuff. So they put him in charge of not a warship, but a scientific ship. A ship, the Endeavor, which was one of these collier boats, one of these coal these boats that carried coal back and forth up and down the coast and put, instead of coal on them, a whole bunch of scientists. And Joseph Banks was the leader of these scientists, guys. He, he himself is also a fascinating figure. Massive wealth. He's sort of like a Boyle type of character, but not near 
the level of Boyle's mind. But, but at the same time, Banks, you know, putting all this energy into it. So Banks is the great aristocrat. Here's the, here's the tradesman class captain. And uh, he's going to be interested primarily in latitude and longitude and charting things, does these great maps and charts. And, and he's also in the background got he's heard that there's an Australia. Now he's going to find Australia, but by his mind, Australia was Antarctica. And he wanted to get to Antarctica, but never gets there. No one's ever been there. This is the second journey and uh, he almost gets to Antarctica, but he never sees it, you know. But he's wandering around here doing a, a bunch of jobs at once as captain. This is Botany Bay, where the, uh, you know, they eventually create a prison. Sort of, uh, they send uh, riffraff from uh, England to, Bot to Australia and stuff like that. But it's Botany Bay because that's where um, the Endeavor landed and banks and all these botanists and biologists and all these other people did their work. Uh, this is the uh, rebuilt Endeavor, what it looked like. This Collier, there's Cook. And just for fun facts to know and tell, they just, they recently, within the last few years, discovered the Endeavor. It's, it's wreck is off the coast of Rhode Island, and uh, which is, I think, sort of fun for us. You know, um, to get back, this is a scientific boat. And so in 17... Um, uh, 68, when, when uh, Cook and Banks go in the Endeavor, 1768, that's when the American Revolution is starting to get feisty, you know. And when the American Revolution is actually happening, uh, you see these, these voyages here? American Revolution is actually happening. There's a deal cut between the United States and Britain, enemies, that Cook's boat can go do its own thing. Cook is not a warrior boat, Cook is a science boat. So it's a Royal Navy ship with a Royal Navy officer, but because he's doing science, we're gonna let him through and not bother him. And this is, this is uh, one step backward in my mind also from, from Haley, because Haley, the a royal society had really sort of pushed to have a have a, a civilian captain of a of the ship that was supplied by the navy, and Haley is this civilian captain here with a Cook. You're no longer going to get civilian captains. You have a navy captain, and then the scientist is part of the cargo. Okay, and so the ultimate then trip of Darwin is is that sort of story. You have Fitzroy who's a great meteorologist and becomes one of the very important sort of uh, beginners of, of, you know, sort of like regular forecasting of weather in Britain and stuff like that. And then he is, he needs a, a companion to go with him. If you've ever watched the movie Master and Commander, this idea of the captain having a, a scientific companion uh, for the dinner table conversations and stuff. You're going to go out there for a number of years. And so... Darwin goes as the uh, dinner table companion. And it's Darwin who, who uses this voyage of the Beagle. Uh, it's a great thing to read. Uh, read the Beagle. Oh, you know, um, the, the re relationship between the two and how they, it works. It's, it's, it's the British Empire at its height, you know, we, where, uh, you know, um, they own the world, they think. And they're, they're uh, figuring out science and the cockiness of it all is, is tremendous. But at the same time, it's, uh, Darwin is very much interested not in the sort of super complexities that Haley had envisioned and that uh, um, Cook actually you know, knew of too. Uh, Darwin is much more like when he looks at those finches and stuff, he is gonna search for that model, sort of that like the old demographics where you where you use mathematics to chart what is something that maybe isn't real but it works and then he and then of course Darwin did the great thing of uh, uh, um, not only seeing it but then describing a mechanism of variation or random variation and then natural selection and so so this is European mentality European intellectual life 
in the age of, of figuring out the earth, the age of geodesy. And uh, you and I don't live in that age anymore. We're all so dang confident. We get in a plane and we zip around. We forget the tides. We forget the wind. We forget all of the, you know, the world is doing so much to us to forget its chaos, except this virus we got going right now. This virus right now is in many ways reminding us that the, of those chaotic anomalies, these, these things that can happen. And that the, uh, the earth is not, uh, and biology, is not something you can simply model easily. So give me a call. Do the, uh, do the assignment.